Sure, thank you. We might have to give you a field. We might have to give you a field job and give her a deal. <laughs> no, no, no. He loves her, right? <laughs> oh, we got big old field. Oh, me. All right. So. Chapter 4, 2 Timothy this evening again. We're going to finish up this evening. I was thinking about breaking this into two parts, but everything that's going together here from chapter verse 6 all the way through verse 22, it just goes so much together. So we're going to finish up this evening. Um, and I'm excited about this evening. I love what Paul does here. It's one of the most beautiful parts. Not my favorite part from 2 Timothy, but it's one of the most beautiful parts of what he does right here as he sums up and brings it all together. Let me give you a quick review where we've been so far. Endure and be faithful in what God has entrusted to you. It's not going to be easy, but endure by holding on to his word, by abiding in Christ and as you rely on the Holy Spirit, and guard what has been entrusted to you. And then week two, Paul said here in 2 Timothy, get about what's most important. Get about the business of the church, and the business of the church is making disciples that make more disciples. Endure in making disciples. It's not easy. And in the process, flee. Flee from those youthful passions, those things that make your work and work in life dishonorable and ineffective for the in making disciples. Flee from them and endure by pursuing. Flee, he says, pursue. Pursue what? Righteousness. His righteousness. Pursue a deeper faith in Christ. Pursue His love and His peace. Pursue Christ's likeness and don't try to do it on your own. You're going to fall flat on your face if you do. Pursue Him with other brothers and sisters that encourage you, pray for you, that walk with you, that will grow with you, and will hold you accountable. Endure what you know to be true and hold on to that. In other words, what Paul said in chapter 3, endure in the God, breathe, theos, noustos, word of God. And he also says, be sober-minded last week. Don't let anything control your mind except for God. Endure the suffering and persecution that is to be expected with following Christ. Do the work of evangelists. Proclaim Jesus Christ. And what Paul is saying right here, he said at the end of verse 5, endure in the God-given ministry that God prepared for you and you alone before time began. And I said this last week, and it's one of those things that I've really, it's really hit home for me as I was preparing for last week and throughout this week. You are the only you that God created. And what the church needs most from each and every one of us individually is for us to fulfill our God-given ministry. Whether it's to hold an office, or whether it's just to go out and teach in Bible school, Sunday school, Work in a pantry, just something, whatever it is, the God given ministry that He, that's what the church needs most from you. We're going to talk more about that actually later on today. And all of that, it brings us to the conclusion tonight of 2 Timothy. And here in chapter 4, that we're going to see tonight, these are some of the final words of Paul here in this world. And there's his last words that are written down in Scripture for us. Here, Paul is sharing some very important truths to Timothy in regards to life and ministry. And I'm just going to dive right in, and I'm going to reference the scripture as I get to it this evening. Truth number one that we're going to see from verse 6 here in chapter 4 all the way through 22. Truth number one, following Jesus and life and ministry is hard. Well, duh, we know that, right? This is one thing that I have learned over many years of following Christ, whether I was a pastor or ordained pastor or not. Life in ministry is tiring, it's difficult, it's frustrating at times, and it can absolutely wear you out. Following Jesus and life in ministry is not for the faint of heart. But that's the thing. All of us, as I said last week, all of us are called into some type, some capacity of ministry. And so all of us should already know this. And I think we do. I heard it once said. 
If you want an easy and comfortable life, if you want to make people happy all the time, don't follow Jesus. Don't go into any form of ministry. You know what he, this person said you should do? Buy an ice cream truck and sell ice cream. And even then, there are people still going to complain. Amen? Amen. Following Jesus in a life of ministry to others is hard and it's painful at times. Paul there in verse 6, he says this, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. Listen, this drink offering here, for us, it's a little bit of a foreign idea. But for them, 2,000 years ago, they knew what he was talking about. The drink offering in the Old Testament sacrificial system. It was the final offering that followed the burnt and the grain offerings. Here, Paul saw his coming death as his final offering to God in a life that has been poured out as a sacrifice to God and for others. And that his time of departure was near. This word departure in the Greek, it carries the meaning of something being loosened. And, and, and oftentimes, the same words used in, in, in the idea of like this, like ropes that were tying the ship to the dock so that it could be loosened and set free and depart. Or the ropes that held up, helped hold up the tents, and they would loosen the ropes, and they'd pick up the tents, and they'd go off. That's what this departure word means. In other words, what Paul is saying right here, talking about a drink offering, is this. The things that have bound me in this world are about to be loosened as I prepare to make the transition from this address in this world to my heavenly address forever. And that's what he's saying here. He says, I'm being poured out for one last sacrifice to God for your sake and for his glory. And when I depart, Paul says, I will forever be free from the things of this world that so easily entangle me. And I'll be in the presence of Jesus. So in verse 7, Paul says this. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Oh, this is so powerful right here. He fought the good fight. I think we all know what that means. Living for Christ is a daily battle, and it's not easy. Listen to me. If you haven't got some scrapes and cuts along the way, if you haven't had any bruises or bloody noses, if you don't have some battle scars mentally, physically, and emotionally while you're following Jesus, the question has to be asked, are you even in the fight in the first place? We're going to have some scars. I know I've had plenty of those along the way. But the good news about having scars for the name of Jesus Christ, He is the one that heals them. And I take the scars and I wear them as a badge of honor, honor for Christ's sake. And in those scars that I collected, I learned more and more and more. You see, in a fight in the Christian life and ministry, it is a daily fight. You're going to have battle scars because following Christ is not easy and it's not comfortable. It is full of joy. It is full of peace. But it's not easy. Paul says, I fought the good fight. And then he says, I finished the race. Question. How many of y'all in here like taking a six-mile run every day? You like taking a six-mile run? Anybody want to see Phil do that sometime? I do. <laughs> Now, back before I had my three knee surgeries when I was still in college, I'd go out every day down in Greenville in 100 degree heat. Flat land, thank God. And I'd run six to eight miles a day. I've had three knee surgeries. See, you and me will go out, brother. We'll see, we'll see how much you like your run. No, I couldn't do that anymore. Because every time I run, in the first 30 seconds I start running, my knee looks like a beach ball because I've had three knee surgeries. I can't run anymore like that. We all know that running a long race and it takes time. It takes patience. It takes training and self-discipline. You get tired. You get worn out. 
And there may even be times in that preparing for that long race, or even in that long race, that you want to take the towel and throw it in and quit. I've heard it said, and you've heard it said, the Christian life is a marathon, not a sprint. And that is so true. Amen? Amen. You have to methodically train and prepare. It's lived over a lifetime, so you have to be patient. Results. And we live in a society and a world that tells us we should expect immediate results. But results take time. And if you're expecting immediate success in the Christian life, you're going to get some results. But if you expect immediate success all the time, you're going to be sorely disappointed. And when things get frustrated, you have to keep doing what you know to do and what His Word says. And we know this because sometimes the people we pray for, sometimes it takes years for Jesus Christ to reach them and the Holy Spirit to move in them to bring salvation. Sometimes it takes that time. And it's there you have to be self-disciplined to keep doing what you know to do no matter how bad and how frustrated you are. Fight the good fight. Wear those scars as a badge of honor for Christ's sake and keep running the race. And this is where it gets so awesome here, there, right there in verse 7. What's interesting here in verse 7, Paul puts fighting the good fight. He, can, he puts finishing the race right before keeping the faith. And he associates these two first things with keeping the faith. What Paul is saying here is very clear. Keeping the faith, living out the Christian life, is a daily battle that we must constantly strive for and fight to live out. It takes time, patience, training, and self-discipline. You will get tired. You will get worn out. You may have doubts. You may have questions. And at times, you may get so frustrated. You just want to quit. And what makes the Christian life and life of ministry even more difficult? It's truth number two. Even some of your family and friends will turn their backs on you. Look there beginning in verse 10. It says this. For Demas, in love with this present world, he has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Skip down to verse 14. Paul says, even Alexander the copy, co a coppersmith, he did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. At my first offense, no one came to stand beside me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. I don't know about you. Brother Phil, if somebody, if my friends and my family all desert me for Jesus Christ, I'm going to want come, I want, I want lightning strike, lightning bolts to come back. That's our heart. May it not be charged against them. Oh man, how I can have a heart like Paul. Yeah. Oh. Even your family and friends will turn your back, their backs on you. Jesus said in Matthew 24, right after the disciples asked, when will these things take place, Jesus? Jesus said, don't be led astray. Many will come saying, they are the Christ, or there is the Christ, and teach many false things. Nations will rise against nations. You will be hated. Many will betray one another and hate one another. In Matthew 10, when Jesus sends them out, the apostles and disciples out, he says, brothers will rise against brothers. And deliver them to death. Fathers will rise up against their children and children against their parents. You will be hated not just by the world, but by those that are closest to you that you would never think they would turn their back on. Question. Do you ever feel like among your family and friends, they just don't get why you live the way you do because you were following the words of Jesus Christ? I do. We all do. Can I give you a little hint? You're living out the words that Jesus predicted in Matthew 10 and Matthew 24. Don't be surprised. Don't be caught off guard by it. Expect it. 
And still use your prayers and your words to bless them and pray for them. Embrace the scars you will receive because you are suffering for the sake of Jesus Christ. And it's worth it. Jesus said in the Beatitudes of Matthew 5, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. You are blessed when they hate you and mock you for yours is the kingdom of heaven and great will be your reward. Brace yourself. We're getting to the reward tonight. They did the same to the prophets and Jesus. Why would we expect any less? Following Jesus is hard. Life and ministry is tiring and difficult. And what makes it even worse is when your family and friends, they turn your backs on you, the ones closest to you. But you know what makes the Christian life and the life of ministry so good, even in light of all this? It's truth number three. And we've already talked about this in this series. The Christian life, the Christian walk, it is a team sport. There will be those that turn their backs on you and abandon you. But rejoice. And rely on those faithful brothers and sisters that have got your back as you're walking. Amen. We can't walk this walk without God, and we can't walk this walk without each other. I'm not going to read the verses, but look there at the second part of verse 10. All the way through verse 21. Fifteen different brothers or sisters are mentioned there. Along with, at the end of verse 21, Paul says, Greetings from all the brothers. Isn't it good to know that my brother or my sister has got my back? It's good news. Even if they're, Paul saying in this section, even if they're not physically present with me, I know they're praying for me, and I know they're going to do whatever they can to help me and encourage me. You want to fall flat on your face and fail in the Christian walk? Then try to live the Christian life and do ministry on your own. That's the best way to do it. Lone Ranger Christianity, Christianity is not biblical. Think of it this way. I love watching NCIS, CSI. I've started actually watching Hawaii 5 here recently. Not the older series, but the newer series. So, but think of these. I, 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 like, I like, think of this example. I like these crime shows. And they come up with some very sick and twisted things sometimes. Amen? And he just back there, Glenda's back there. Yep. And I like watching. Think of this. If you're walking on the beach and you see a withered foot wash up on the shore, what would you think? Number one, the first thing I'd be thinking, I'm calling the cops. But number two, I'm thinking somebody's missing a foot. They're probably struggling to walk if they're even still alive. You see, our physical bodies need every part to function the way God intends us to function. And the church, the church needs every part if it's going to function the way God intends it to. That means as part of the church, as part of His body, you have purpose and you're needed. Those of you watching online, I love you when I say this, but I say this in all truth. You are needed, not on your sofa, watching from a distance, not showing up for an hour every Sunday or one Sunday a month. We need you to be a functioning and active part of the life and the mission of the church constantly and consistently. Listen to me. We recently went through this here in this church. We need you to be a functioning and active part of the life and the mission of the church constantly and consistently. That's how you define an active church member. 
Someone that is consistently and constantly part of the life of the church. And I say this in all love. If you don't meet that criteria, then you are not an active member of the church. Amen? You can agree or not, but that's what the New Testament clearly presents. So you can take your argument up with God, not me. We are in this together. So be here, be present, be active in the mission of his church that he is building for his glory. Those are the three truths we see here. So the question comes from this text. How do we endure? How do we endure, endure when it seems like everyone and everything is against us? How? What is Paul's motivation for fighting, running the race, and finishing well? What keeps Paul moving forward even when no one goes with him? He's here. He's there sitting in prison in Rome. How does Paul keep the faith? What Paul does here at the end of 2 Timothy is so beautiful and encouraging for us. Because basically what Paul is saying, everything we need to endure has already been supplied by God. We already have everything we need. 2 Peter 1. Five things real as quick as I can. Number one, we endure by holding on to God's promises. Look at verse 8 there. I love verse 8. Henceforth, Paul says, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, he will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. We endure by holding on to his promises. The righteousness that is found only in Jesus Christ. Think of it. He took my sin. He forgave me. It's gone as far as the east is from the west. And Jesus Christ closed me in his righteousness. And therefore, a crown of righteousness awaits Paul. And not only Paul, but all who have placed their hope for salvation in Jesus Christ. Now listen to this. This is where it gets so powerful. The crown here in the Greek, it carries the meaning of surrounding. Think of a crown. It goes all the way around your head. It surrounds your head, right? That's the meaning. It, it, that's what the meaning it carries. Surrounding. It also goes with the wreaths and garlands. It was used to talk of the wreaths and, wreaths and garlands placed on the heads of dignitaries. Victorious military officers and victorious athletes in the day. The crown carries the member the meaning of surrounding. And to get the full picture of what's going on, what Paul's saying here, we need to look at all five of the crowns in the wreaths that are mentioned in Scripture. James 1, the crown of life. 1 Thessalonians 2, the crown of boasting and rejoicing in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 9, the imperishable wreath, imperishable. Number 4, 1 Peter 5, the crown of glory. And then number 5 here in 2 Timothy 4, the crown of righteousness. See the pictures we put all of these together. One day we will be surrounded is what Paul is saying. Remember the word for in Greek, for crown and wreath, it basically carries the meaning of surrounding. We, one day, Paul's looking forward to it as he's sitting in prison. He's looking forward to being surrounded by life, rejoicing, imperishable glory, and righteousness for all of eternity. Because he will be, we will be surrounded by the presence of God forever. That's what's going on with these crowns and these wreaths. Paul is confident in his promise and he says that all who place their hope in Jesus Christ and, and love is appearing, they will receive the same promise. Paul's sitting in prison. How is he able to keep his head lifted high with everything he's been going through? By the many great and precious promises 
that God gives us. And Paul knows God has always been faithful and will always be faithful to his promises. You're worn out, you're tired, you're weak. I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. You're faithfully following Christ, but you don't know how you're going to make it or get to where he's leading. My God is going to supply for my every need along the way according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. You feel alone and abandoned. The great commission. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of age. The great and many precious promises of God. You feel like you've completely blown it again? Romans. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Promise after promise after promise from our good and faithful God. You want to know how to get through it and endure when it gets tough? Hold on to the promises of God. Number two, I've already talked about this one too. This is just a summation. Paul's just summing up what he's already told us. Number two, we endure by holding on to God's word. Look at what Paul tells Timothy in verses 11 and 13. He says, they've all abandoned me. Luke alone is with me. Hey, Timothy, get Mark and bring him with you. For he's very useful to me for ministry that he says in verse 13 this is the key right here check this Timothy when you come to me bring the cloak that I left with Carpus and Troas also the books the books the books and above all the parchments now some of this the books and the parchments some of this were his letters and his writings some were possibly letters that were written to Paul. And some of these were copies of the Old Testament books. Sitting in prison, alone, abandoned by many. What did Paul want the most? To read the great, many great and precious promises of God found in God's Word. He wanted God's Word. Oh, how I love Psalm 119. It's all about the word of God. Listen to what Psalm of Psalm 119 says. Your word is my delight and my counsel. My soul is consumed by your word. My eyes are fixed on your word and I store it up in my heart. Your word gives me life. I will meditate on it. It strengthens me. I will cling to it. Let your steadfast love come to me through your word. Your word is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. I will rejoice in your word forever. The promises found in God's word, it gives me peace. It gives me courage. It gives me comfort. It gives me strength. No matter where I'm at, even if I'm sitting like Paul in a prison cell. Amen. Number three, very simple. I'm not going to spend any time on this because I already spent a whole session on this. We endure together. We endure together. And what about when we're alone and all by ourselves? Number four, we endure in and with the presence of God. Look there at verses 16 and 17 real quick. Paul says in my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. And then verse 17, this is awesome. But when I was all alone and by myself and everybody deserted me, but the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me, the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. Huh. The good news is this. There are going to be days when you're so frustrated, tired, and worn out that you're going to feel all alone as you're following Christ. But the truth is, when you're in Christ, you're never alone. His presence, the Holy Spirit, is with you at all times, and there's nothing that you can do to get rid of 
or lose the Holy Spirit. Once you have the Holy Spirit, He's with you forever. You're never alone. Matthew 28. Behold, I will be with you to the end of age. Fifth and final truth. I'm not going to cover too much on this because I did most of this for 45 minutes on Sunday morning during Mother's Day. We endure in and by the grace of God. So many, when they come to Paul's letters, they get to the end of Paul's letter, they just brush past the typical standard closing of Paul when he says, may grace be with you. Look at what he says there in verse 22. He says, the Lord be with you, with your spirit. Grace be with you. Grace be with you. I talked about this Sunday morning. If you didn't catch it, go back and catch Mother's Day. Because it was all about the grace of God. And this is pretty much what I said Sunday. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter your background. What has shaped you into who you are today. Faithful follower or somebody that's turned their back to God. When it comes to God's grace... None of that matters. His grace is infinitely greater and more powerful. God's grace is sufficient for whatever you have done, whatever you're going through, or for whatever you're going to face. We're all in need of God's grace every day, all the time. And here's the good news. No matter where you are, who you are, what you've done, what your background, no matter what, God's Grace is available to all who call upon Him, to all who repent and turn to Him with a pure heart. That's some good news. Especially when I blow it again. And we're all going to blow it again. Paul's point here at the end of each letter when he says, May my grace, may God's grace and peace be upon you. Paul's point is very simple. Don't go past it. Because here, as we conclude this series tonight, we've been talking about enduring. We know that the Christian life, it is hard. It is difficult. But here's the thing. Paul says here at the end of 2 Timothy, by God's grace, we can and we will endure. Isn't that some good news tonight? It has nothing to do with my ability or my talent or anything I know. It all has to do about God's grace because he's going to complete the good work that he started in me. And he'll do the same thing for you. By God's grace, we can and we will endure. <clears throat> and so as I conclude this series, the words of Paul here at the end of 2 Timothy. These are my words to us tonight. May his grace be with you every step of the way. By God's grace, you will endure. By God's grace, he will take you home. By God's grace, we will be with him for all of eternity. Grace, grace, marvelous grace. Grace that is greater than all my sins. By His grace, we will endure. Father, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. We thank you for that wonderful, wonderful grace. Thank you for your word. We thank you for your promises. We thank you for brothers and sisters. So much to thank you for. We just want to say we love you. And we ask tonight, help us endure. Let us see more of you. Reveal yourself, your mercy, your grace, your love and compassion. Reveal your glory to us more and more and more to strengthen our faith. Because the stronger our faith grows, the more we'll be able to endure. And by your grace, one day, we will stand in your presence and see Jesus face to face. We love you. 
We thank you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you all very much for being here. Love you all. Have a great rest of the week.